Danielle, it is so delightful to have you here. And I want to jump right in. But before I do, let me say first that it is such an exciting thing to be in the company of a masterful, a truly masterful teacher. You know, I, I look in, uh, in, at, at your um, uh, programs online uh, over the past year, and it's been so exciting to see you engage with undergraduates, with, with private citizens, and no matter what, you always seem to just coax the excitement out of them, um, even if it's you know, I don't know many people, Danielle, who can talk about two sentences in the Declaration of Independence for an hour and have everybody riveted. And so it's that 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 extraordinary reminder of what great teaching can do and why it's so transformational. So thank you for being one of those extraordinary teachers that that changes lives. Thank you, Emily. That's just incredibly kind and generous. You know, I think you just pointed to the nerd in me. I do love ideas. I love books. And it's always just a thrill to be able to share that passion and sense of joy with others. So thank you for that. That was really very generous of you. So, so let's jump into the Declaration. You've talked about the Declaration of Independence as being our most important statement about how we govern ourselves within a democratic order. You know, why is that, why is this short text so important to our understanding of a democratic order? Well, you know, it's just incredibly concise and it really is adding to the vocabulary, the language of political philosophy, a really key element of human understanding. And that thing it adds is the notion that each of us is the person best situated to make judgments about our own perspective, health, safety, happiness, well-being, that nobody else's judgment can replace our own judgment. So we have then both a need to be able to exercise our own judgment in shaping our lives, but also responsibility to understand how to do that and how to do that while others are also doing it. So then you get that core political problem of how it is that we connect our different emancipated judgments with one another in collective decision making. That's really the kind of core um, issue that the Declaration points to. And I think it's honestly the sort of the, the earliest pithiest statement of both that human goal, human need, and the challenge that comes with it. So Think back to the, the framers themselves. Were they in, in, in articulating this um, uh, pithy philosophical statement about freedom, about equality, about human agency, it's all packed in there. Were the drafters teaching the, their contemporaries something that they had not known before or were they just naming something that felt familiar uh, to everyone that once seeing it, it could, it could be brief because it was automatic, yes, I get it right in that moment when I hear it for the first time or read it for the first time. I think it's it's a little bit more subtle than that even actually. So I don't exactly think it's just that they were rendering something everybody already understood. I think they were crystallizing an understanding that had been growing over time. So in order for you to exhibit this, I am going to have to just recite the second sentence. So you'll have to forgive me for doing that. But so I welcome it. Okay. You'll remember, you know, the sort of all important sentence, the second sentence is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying the foundation on such principle and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness. Okay, it's a super long sentence. We tend to focus on the first part of it, the self-evident truths, starting with a list of individual rights, those build to the idea that political institutions secure our rights. But then there's this conclusion that we can change those institutions if they're failing at their job of securing our rights. And it's really in the last clause that I think they make their most important contribution. So it's a, there is a sense in which, yes, the natural rights vocabulary has already been in use, it's been deployed. But there's a real question, like, what does it actually mean to live on the basis of this idea that people's own emancipated judgment should be the ground for what we do collectively in a society. 
And that's what they answer at the very end when they say it's the right of the people you know, to make these changes, alter or abolish it by doing two things, laying a foundation on principle and organizing the powers of government to deliver whatever the people judge to be best to affect their safety and happiness. So it's those two things, the notion that you have to have a foundation of principle and that you also have to think intentionally about how to organize the powers of government to deliver on that principle. That hasn't been articulated previously, right? And this is really what lies beneath their evolution into constitution writers, because of course, they were from a country, you know, England, the United Kingdom, that understood itself to have a constitution. The British used that vocabulary of their own constitution, but it wasn't a written document. And so what they were really working out in that moment in 1776 was how to coordinate action. You need a shared purpose, a common purpose. That's that statement of principle. But then you actually also need institutional design mechanisms that make it possible, again, for individual judgments about personal pathways to be integrated with some kind of collective judgment about a collective pathway. And we can fiddle and fuddle and futz and meddle and muddle our way to finding what those institutions are, or we can be intentional about how we do constitutional design. And it was really that kind of bringing into clarity the fact that there's this intellectual work called organizing the powers of government. And it's gotta be hooked up with laying a foundation on principle that is an, an innovation, it's a breakthrough. And I actually think that when they were writing that declaration, that part of it, uh, they weren't just doing it for the broad public, they were actually doing it for themselves to clarify in Continental Congress, like what was the job they had in front of them? And indeed, because that is what they then proceeded to do, you know, they gave themselves that task of, of drafting that, that, that Declaration of Principle, the Declaration of Independence, laying the foundation. And at the same time, they also set up a committee to draft the Articles of Confederation. And I'm just underscoring this because I think we've lost clarity about that important distinction between sort of principles that guide us and orient us. And then this other equally intentional and precise work about designing institutional structures. So that is just an incredible gift that the document provides. So I want to I want to slow the speed down a, a little bit and, and unpack that that distinction uh, between principles and you've you've I've heard you describe it before as the first job of citizenship mm -hmm. is to ensure the fact that the foundation of governance is based on principle. So let's start there. And we'll get to the we'll get to the second job of the citizen, uh, which is to organize the powers of government to deliver on those principles. But first, let's focus in on. Uh, on an example or two of the sort of principles that you're talking about and what makes them principles as opposed to sort of an operational or, or, a, or, or more of a tactic? What's, what's sure. when you talk about principles, can you give me a, a sense of what you're, what you're describing? I mean, some levels we could sort of say it's the kind of easy distinction between the what, you know, and then the, the who and the how. Yeah, so the what is, you know, what, what are we trying to build here by way of a world for human beings? And in the, the declaration as a whole is a statement of principle. It's a statement that human beings is a part of their thriving um, need to make their own judgments about whether or not their political institutions are supporting that thriving and then, you know, change them if need be. And so as a statement of principle it is um, making a kind of fundamental point about the right of the people taken as a whole, as well as the rights of individual people. And it's also making a fundamental claim about the connection between human well being and that emancipation that I'm talking about. So that's the what. The what is we are trying to build a world of emancipated people whose emancipation is nonetheless compatible with their governing together. Okay, so that's the what. Um, and so then, yes, then after you've, then you have to see, well, how, how do we actually do that? That, that? that sounds kind of tricky, you know? So then we get into the question of organizing the powers of government. So let's focus in on that, that agency, that principle of agency for, for a moment. Uh, this is that idea that you started out with that, that, that first of all, we as human beings, we have agency to uh, make our tomorrow better or at least attempt to try to make tomorrow better than our yesterday and we have the raw materials 
available to us to at least pursue that. It doesn't mean that we're successful, but it means that we have the ability to pursue that effectively. Let me ask you this, uh, the question this way to tie it to our contemporary context. Are we in jeopardy of losing that sense of agency, that sense that, that of, of self-efficacy? Um, you know, at what point, for example, does our care for one another, something that we want to be able to, um, we want to be in community together, we want to govern with each other, we want to solve problems together at a, in a Tocquevillian uh, sense. Uh, at what point does care for one another, for example, tip over into something that looks more like infantilizing or superintending or undermining that agency that you describe as being so central to the declaration? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So I think this is where the question of how we organize the powers of government does come in. So it has to be a basic principle of how the powers of government are organized that they protect the project of emancipation, that they invite the activity of individual judgment, um, that they engage people in processes of collective decision-making. So in other words, I think it really matters that as we are trying to identify those parts of the work in our community that we can't actually do separately, that we could only do collectively, um, we, we nonetheless need in the doing of that work uh, sort of processes and practices that build on the judgment of the citizenry. To some extent, that's just what representation is supposed to do, right? That is what the sort of in, in, the, in principle and in the ideal the job of Congress is, is to make sure that um, the emancipated judgment of the people is always shaping the design um, of the constraints that the people then is going to live under or the kind of um, supportive um, scaffolds that the people is going to build for itself. Um, and so, you know, I think that's a question that we have now, you know, is representation working? Does it in fact emancipate our judgment in appropriate ways um, or have changes in the size of our country or the scale of our country or the way in which our media ecosystem operates have changes of this kind brought a fundamental challenge to representation and the way it is supposed to work in both connecting people to collective judgments and ensuring that their emancipated judgment is at the center of the work we're doing together. So let me talk, uh, uh, go back to that phrase. You talked about the judgment of the citizenry and, and we can uh, articulate that judgment of the citizenry as if we know what that is and that that's, that's a clear thing. But of course, it's an incredibly messy uh, process to get to the judgment of the citizenry. And, you, and you've also uh, alluded to the fact that we need to find sort of in a, be in a discovery process with one another in which we're, we're trying to discover what that judgment is. We're trying to yeah. understand and flesh out what those shared values are. And the only way to do that is to actually talk to each other. The only way to do that is to be in real conversations. But it seems to me that that uh, we've had trouble of late of being in productive, thoughtful, meaningful conversations with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, so would you mind uh, thinking through with me about uh, through this project of, of what does, a, if, if a citizenry is to engage in uh, a, a kind of productive conversation around shared values, what is required of uh, our conversational norms? What do we need to be doing differently than we're currently doing to have those good conversations? Right, okay, thank you for that. Let me actually, I'm gonna um, turn the crank ever so slightly on your question sure. um, to make it a two-part <laughs> question. Um, so there is work to be done in about that are, sorry, there is work to be done in having conversations about shared values, but there's also work to be done in having conversations about what our shared work should be, okay? And I think it's actually important to, to pull these two things apart because sometimes what we fight over is whether or not a given activity should be shared work or should be rather the work of in, you know, smaller units, communities or families or the like. So we might actually, for example, say share a value, um, you know, let's say maybe it's the value of, of good schools um, but nonetheless disagree about whether or not good schools should be the shared work of say the federal government or state governments or local governments or just families, right? And so I think it's just important to call out that there are these two different potential registers of disagreement. 
And in truth, I think our, our disagreements these days are more in the second category than in the first category, which is probably a bit surprising to say, and I'll come back to that in a second. But I think if you look back at the original design of the Constitution, one of the things that is really striking about it is that they put a lot of effort into answering the question of which things should be shared work at the scale of the entire nation, which things should be shared work at the level of the state, you know, which things should be shared work at the level of the community. And the examples will be familiar, right? So the defense, the military was an example of shared work at the level of the whole nation. There's no good way to do defense unless you took it up to the scale of the whole. In contrast, their view at the time was, for example, the agricultural policy didn't make any sense done at a national scale because the sort of diversity of needs was too sufficient and the decision makers needed to be more proximate to the specific you know, literally geography of, of where the agricultural policy was being enacted. So that was something that they expected to see cited at the level of the state. And I think that we actually need to rebuild that capacity intellectually to just go ahead and have a conversation about, you know, when is a function suddenly something that has to be done at a national level, you know, versus when it should be at a state level. So as an example, in the kind of all of our fights around COVID, I think one of the kind of core issues was that we just couldn't actually quite see those distinctions. Um, so for instance, um, you know, in Germany, which also has a federal system, one of the very first things that they did was actually just create a data architecture that could be used across all of Germany. They left a lot of other kinds of decision making at a local level, more autonomous, but they recognized that they all did need to be in one conversation. And since data is these days very important to our conversations, they needed a single sort of data infrastructure, metadata and the like. I think that's a similar situation in, in this country now, that there are many domains of policy where we actually do really need the federal government to do the work of creating the relevant data structure that we could all then use in different and independent ways across states. But that is to sort of take, put the time in and say, well, of the functions that we actually really need to sort of be able to activate right now, you know, which ones are properly cited at a whole, whole, whole national level, which ones are better cited at a state level or municipal level or tribal level or territorial or family level. So anyway, that was a very long-winded way of saying, I think that's what our fight is actually about, um, more so than about shared values. So let me come, if you don't mind, it's a long answer, but if you'll bear with me, I'll say something about shared values too. Is that okay, Emily? Absolutely. Okay. So on the shared values front, I thought that this was where our biggest fight was, all right? And I think many of us do. And I recently had the pleasure and privilege of co-chairing the American Academy of Arts and Sciences report on um, trying to build a healthy democracy for the 21st century. And we ran listening sessions all over the country as a part of doing that work to understand people's frustrations with our current democracy. One of the things that we wanted to dig into was whether or not people could articulate a picture of shared values. We thought that this was going to be fundamentally impossible to do. As it turned out, we actually found it was very easy to get a picture of about 85% of sort of set of vocabulary that people do share. So people on both left and right are willing to endorse the values of both freedom and equality. Um, people on both left and right are willing to endorse the values of rule and law and constitutionalism, equal opportunity, equal protection of the law, um, you know, co concepts of this kind. So there is actually a remarkably sort of sturdy agreement around those terms. But there was one thing that provoked just complete and impassable disagreement as we sought to get this sort of sketch of shared values. That was the question of how we should name the relationship that we members of the citizenry have with one another. So for folks on the right, the necessary word was patriotism. And that would be a bond to each other and to country. And for people on the left, the necessary word was solidarity. And this was, was unbridgeable. There was no way of getting either side to use the vocabulary of the other. And so we did take from our work on the commission, the learning that the thing we're actually struggling with above all else is simply this question of how we should name the tie that is supposed to bind us to one another. So it's sort of a human relational question that is the thing that we are most stuck on. What'd you find is your answer? How did well, you solve the solidarity versus patriotism 
Um, you know, we Dilemma. didn't find an answer. So what we did say was that we thought we needed a strategy to work on uh, rebuilding, and then it's a mouthful, um, a sense of mutual commitment to one another and to our constitutional democracy. So we ended up using that bundle of words in the place of a single word and trying to sketch out some pathways um, that would let us all dig into the question of um, how we might rebuild that sense of mutual commitment to one another and a shared commitment to our constitutional democracy. This reminds me, all of this reminds me of Eleanor Ostrom's work. I'm yeah. not sure if, uh, if, if, if you're as excited about uh, her work as I am, but the, um, I am. I am. yeah, she's, uh, her, her project of identifying uh, the ways in which human beings, we are social beings by, by our nature, we're drawn to live in communities with other people. And because we aren't auto autonomous individuals and in, uh, in isolation, we bump into each other and we need to figure out ways to resolve what happens when we bump into each other. And this is just the very human thing called governance. And that we have all sorts of capability to solve those problems and they tend we tend to find ways to solve them from the bottom up uh, and one of the core insights that uh, that she has in her work is that that when you're trying to solve problems together it's it's not a question of either it is a collective uh, decision making or not more often than not it's it's far more it's like what's the right place to locate the policy question exactly is it at the national level say for example with national defense or is it at the literally the private individual or household level where it's like th there are some there's there's a whole universe of things where we don't want anyone else superintending a solution on on private mm -hmm. matters and then there's a whole Whole bunch of stuff right in the middle yeah. and and it could be at the state level it could be at a county or a city or even a community level but that is the first order of business where in some sense the um the the the, the question of what our uh, common commitments are and the the nuts and bolts of operations of of governance kind of collide is where to locate the decision making process. And I'm wondering exactly. if you might think think out loud a little bit about about that challenge and how we how we become better at governing ourselves just by asking that question better. I think you've just said it perfectly and yes, I mean Eleanor Ostrom's work is an influence on my work, so you're quite right to register that and pick that up. Um, and I do think it's our fundamental problem right now. So the way I tend to think about it is that for the challenges we have, the human challenges, human problems that we have, for any given challenge or problem, you may want a different configuration of relationships among public sector mechanisms, market mechanisms, and civil society mechanisms, by which I mean organizational forms higher than the level of the individual, but uh, not commercial, basically. Um, so public sector, civil society, and market mechanisms. And I think we have gotten into what I take to be a bad habit in this country of thinking that like it either all has to be market or all has to be public sector. Whereas actually the job is to really look problem by problem at what the right configuration of those three categories of mechanisms is. Um, and then, you know, beginning to develop some more clarity about why one chooses one thing or the other. So again, if you go back to the Federalist Papers, um, they had real crystal clarity about why they were going to put some things at the national or federal level and why they were going to put other things at the state level. And that is that kind of understanding is really atrophied for us. So at the end of the day, you know, my kind of intellectual project at the moment is to try to um, bring attention back to the concept of federalism to say to people, you know, honestly, we've gotten, I think, kind of weak minded in our thinking about federalism. We have these like default understandings of what it is, but they don't actually have traction on even what the original design of our system was for. So you know, the vocabulary, the Federalist Papers is a vocabulary of harmonization of interest. The job was to harmonize the national interest with state interests and you use the federal structure to try to achieve that harmonization. And so that's the kind of concept I'm really focused on is harmonization um, of interest. And again, recognizing that you need the sort of flexibility of you know, what's the level of jurisdiction at which it's appropriate to do something. And then again, how do you combine this package of market, civil society, and public sector mechanisms?
and and that's that's a good segue to where I would like to go next, which is um, your your uh, discussion of the Constitution. And one of the things I love about your work, Danielle, is that when you tell the history of these documents, when you tell the history of the American founding, you um, you do it without a sort of like um, you do it without romance. Right or, or a, a kind of overly romanticizing. Um, you know, these were real human beings. They had you know real challenges and limitations of, of their of their own time and thinking, and and that's that's just part of the mix. And and in part also the the in the imperfections of politics meant that there was some compromises that were really bad compromises. They were freedom limiting compromises, right. compromises rather than freedom enhancing compromises. Uh, but at the same time as you're telling this unvarnished truth, you also seem to leave space for um, some some awe, some some um, uh, level of awe, appropriately understood, some deep appreciation. And I think that you know what a piece in the Atlantic uh, so beautifully captures it, it, it. Its title is "The Flawed Genius of the Constitution." Mm -hmm. And if you wouldn't, uh, if you wouldn't mind taking a bit of time to uh, think that through. Uh, and, and your description, why do you why do you describe it as such as a, as flawed genius? And am I right in in thinking that this um, this balance between critical scrutiny and appreciation is a deliberate is a deliberate um, sort of balancing act? And why is that balance? And if so, why is that balancing act an important thing to do? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, maybe let me start with the second question first, and then I'll come back to the kind of actual um, argument about the Constitution and what um, why it does give me a sense of awe where I see the problems and errors to be. Um, so on the Balancing Act, we, I mean, it's interesting, um, you know, as so Eric Liu uh, often describes this country as a creedal country. Yeah, so we're not, you know, all from same stock of people going back you know millennia or something like that we come from all over this globe and or arrived here or were here you know in the long term for indigenous populations but nonetheless our big now collective population has just countless sources of its demography and we bring so much to it in terms of different religious understandings cultural understandings heritages and the like so what is it that brings us together or unites us it really is common participation in the set of political institutions that are grounded by a set of documents. And so it's those documents that he refers to as the kind of creed um, that makes us a nation. Um, and so as a result, you know, it does mean that every resident as well as citizen of this polity um, has to have a relationship of some kind to those documents um, in order to make sense of where you are and what you're a part of. This has provoked I think a lot of sort of intellectual challenges and emotional challenges for people. And for a long time, we've been kind of, you know, fighting back and forth between two different perspectives. There's the perspective that says, you know, those documents at the beginning, they did entrench enslavement. Um, they did entrench inequalities for women um, and they entrenched uh, sort of a, a war attitude, an adversarial, ultimately genocidal war attitude towards um, indigenous peoples. So that's just the whole thing is rotten from, there's no recuperating it, it's rotten from start to finish. Then we've had this other perspective, which has said, you know, actually, no, there are these sort of statements of principles, but they weren't realized in practice at the time. And so what we have needed is a kind of progressive unfolding to the completion of the original ideals. Um, and so in that second mode, you get an acknowledgement of the problems, but you also get a sense that those original ideals were sort of perfectly expressed and just needed to realize themselves over time. And just as a human being, as a person, I've, I've had to wrestle, you know, between those two points of opinion because, you know, they come at you. I, I teach this material, students will articulate one or the other of you. It's an area of just heightened emotional intensity for so many people. And over time, I've come to realize I just actually have a very different take on it than either of those two um, possibilities. So it doesn't actually seem to me, I think it's wrong to think that ideas are kind of removed from concrete realities. And that, you know, on the second view, you can have these sort of perfect ideas and eventually realities catch up with them. I don't think that's right, because I do think ideas do real work in the world. And so I do think, you know, there are features of the ideas at our origin that made it possible to entrench enslavement. Um, and those are problems in the ideas themselves. 
And so for me, what the project has become has been a really sort of intensely focused philosophical analysis of the founding sets of ideas to figure out both where they went right and where they went wrong and why they went wrong where they did. So that then in the present, we actually have the job of not just realizing things in practice through our institutions, but of actually making philosophical corrections so that we can then do the right things in our institutions on really sturdy ground. And so I'll give you an example of what I mean, if you don't mind, I know I'm going on Please. at length again. No, this, this is helpful. Right. Okay, so this comes back to uh, actually that final clause in the second sentence of the declaration again, the idea that you lay the foundation on principle and then you organize the powers of government. This distinction was really important to how a number of founders thought about the work they were doing, but John Adams in particular. So John Adams, already in the 1770s was being pushed on the question of the suffrage. So he had fellow politicians who would write to him and say, I really think, you know, poor white men without property should have the suffrage. I think, you know, free Negroes should have the suffrage. Or his wife was writing to him and saying, what about the ladies? You know, where do they fit in to this picture? And his answer back in both directions depended on that distinction between the principles and how the powers of government are organized. So he wrote back in both cases, and these are not quotes now, I'm paraphrasing, but he wrote back roughly to say, look, the principles pertain to everybody. What we're building is about the happiness and the rights of everybody. And that should be delivered for everybody in what we're doing. But he said, as far as the powers of organizing government, government are concerned, I'm going to defend what his vocabulary there was, was the masculine system. That's what he said to, to Abigail. That in any made the explicit case, power should be in the hands of men who own property. Okay. And so the point here is that and then what Abigail said back to that was basically, I don't think that's that's right. I don't think people can hold power over others and actually, in fact, realize the protection of their rights. So she was just making that kind of basic critique that. You know, absolute power corrupts exactly the critique they were making against the king of England, right? And she said, you know, I think you know, it, you know, you can try this, but you know, there's been a history of men tyrannizing over wives, and if that history repeats itself under this structure you're designing, then you know, we women are going to have to foment rebellion for voice and representation. Okay, so she's actually making a philosophical criticism here. The point being that. If you're actually going to deliver on those principles where rights are for everybody, then you actually also have to ensure that power is allocated to everybody. You can't allocate power partially and expect to realize protection of rights for everybody. So she, I think, put her finger on a philosophical mistake that her husband and his friends were making. And so when I say we have work to do, that's we have to correct that philosophically. We have to say that organizing the powers of government has to be universal. You have to include everybody in the allocation of power. That's a philosophical correction. And then once you understand that point, then that really changes how you think about the design of our institutions. So right, that was very uh, long-winded, but that's- No, it's uh, really yeah. helpful. And it, and it does get to another another um, critical point that I want to make sure that, that we cover in our time together. And that, and it's going to require a step back in, uh, on my part to um, on vocabulary. So, and you might want to introduce different vocabulary, but you know, when philosophers and political theorists uh, talk about the founding documents and, and the American founding, um, they describe it as part of a broader liberal project. And by liberal, they don't, they don't mean partisan politics as in the opposite of conservative. Conservative, they mean it's the ar arrangements, the political, legal, and social arrangements that allow for an emancipated people to not only pursue their own happiness, but also to govern together. So, so that's what I mean when I use the fra framing of the liberal project. Yeah. And so, and this goes to this sort of like, it, can it be an evolutionary thing? Um, must it be an evolutionary thing? I would say that clearly at the at the outset of the American founding, the liberal project that it was uh, was uh, a, a very much an incomplete project. Arguably, I would say that the, that it's still a work in progress. And so you may use um, different language than this. And if you do, um, please use the language that 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 uh, you like to use. 
but it seems to me that we are at a, at a, at a critical point here because, you know, both from the left and the right, we're seeing um, a push to kind of junk the liberal project, as I've described it, um, that, that this happens in uh, the world where we see very illiberal uh, movements in the world um, that, that are, are worrisome to anyone who cares about living in a pluralistic society where there's um, high levels of tolerance and uh, of difference. People can live, think, and believe differently than others and we can still live productively and peacefully together that's what pluralism is in my mind and and that that's under threat with uh some of the um some of what we see in in terms of the liberalism out there in the world but even in the scholarly traditions we're seeing critiques of the liberal project both from the left and the right and citizens and students are listening to in on this both the illiberalism we see in the world and the, the critiques of liberalism within the academy. And, and would where are you in, in thinking this through? And would you want to call people back? It sounds to me like your focus on the, on the importance of the founding documents just as a starting place is a call back to that broader, grander liberal tradition. And how would you make the case for the liberal project to those who would say, ah, we're beyond that, we can junk that? Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean, I'm absolutely a defender of the liberal project. And um, I actually have a book coming out, I think in the fall sometime um, called Democracy in the Time of Coronavirus, which does make an effort to make the case um, and make the case in terms of rights protection. So I tend to gloss the word liberal as sort of rights protective, but it is also a part of an emancipated people doing the work of self-governance, free and equal citizens self-governing together. And so um, I make the case in a number of ways. I do focus on the case for human well-being um, in empowerment. I take empowerment to be fundamental to human well-being, and I take empowerment to require both space for autonomy in one's private life, but also uh, positive participation in co-creation of the constraints that through our laws and political choices do uh, set parameters for that private autonomy. So, you know, we need both what I call private autonomy and public autonomy in order to truly have empowerment. And I think that's just fundamental to human well-being. So I try to make a kind of case from the sort of intrinsic value of it. I also try to in bring people into experiences of empowerment so that they can just directly feel <laughs> the human good <laughs> that comes from empowerment. Um, and then I think this, then there's this next piece, which is the harder piece. And I would be very curious about your take too on the other side. Um, on the left, um, I think some of the problems uh, or sort of reasons people don't see the value in liberalism is actually because in the liberal project, we have allowed understanding of governance, understanding of some of the things that we were just talking about with sort of federalism and the kind of decision-making that needs to be made, we've allowed that to atrophy. And so people try to operate the institutions of our constitutional democracy and it, it fails, it, it's, it's not fit for purpose. And that then is read as kind of indictment of the liberal project itself rather than as a recognition that um, you know, we've lost the owner's manual. We don't really know how to do this thing anymore. Um, so that, you know, I could say more about sort of diagnosis on the left, but I actually think that that's core to it. I think I struggle more in all honesty to understand the sources of illiberalism on the right. Um, and you know, for me, as I try to look at the right, I see a kind of kaleidoscope of things um, and that I, I can't kind of resolve into a single coherent picture. My guess is there's probably not a single coherent picture at the moment, um, but I'd be very curious to know what your sense is of the sort of rise of illiberalism um, on the right. Yes, I mean, it, it's uh, when, when I see and hear um, leaders around the world advocating, uh, like, you know, in Hungary, Viktor Orban, you know, saying that explicitly what he's advocating is an illiberal democracy. Well, that should give us all pause. Contradiction in terms, yeah. And, and that should give us pause that it, it's, it's uh, but it's also useful in at least peering into his thinking um, about, about the idea that he would know better, um, he and his administration would know better uh, than private, uh, private citizens or local communities 
uh, to um, you know superintend his his uh, ends over over there. So that that's an important uh, an important piece. I think the other thing is that it does for us is it helps us to unpack that language of liberal democracy. You've also uh, described. Um, uh, it as constitutional democracy, mm -hmm. that sometimes we think about democracy as being one thing and we know what that is, but that modifier, whether it's liberal democracy or, or constrained constitutional democracy, that, that's a, that, that those two things are, are separable, but the fact that we lean on that phrase, liberal democracy or constitutional democracy in, in the United States has meaning. And, I'm, and I completely understand why why we default to a um, a shorthand to, to talk about democracy, mm -hmm. but democracy that is unconstrained, I think, is is potentially it is very dangerous, right? If we if we lay open to a population that says, well, if they voted uh, to uh, abridge the rights of minority of minorities, that would be that would be incredibly troublesome, right? So why? Why is it not just democracy? We want to have have constrained democracy or constitutional democracy or liberal democracy, which in my mind all all means the same thing. So perhaps perhaps it is about trying to understand better what we mean by democracy. Yeah, so I, I would go a little further than that, even in the sense that um, so for, so for me, I think it's a mistake when people collapse democracy into the idea of majoritarianism. I do not take majoritarianism to be democracy. I take democracy to be empowerment of the people, where the people means the whole. That means by definition, um, a democracy is, is an entity that combines mechanisms that both do respect majority, majority votes where those are the appropriate tools, but also have minority protecting mechanisms and the like. And you have a kind of, this is the constraint of the constitutional part. You have a complicated balance of mechanisms, the purpose of which is to empower the whole people and to keep each of them free from domination by the others. Um, but I, and I take that to be democracy. And so, you know, I don't, I, I don't accept the definitions of democracy that sort of allied the concept of democracy and the concept of majority vote. And, but I do agree with you. I think that is a common way in which people understand the concept of democracy. In that regard, the kind of definition of it that I just um, offered is really, you know, very similar to Ronald Dworkin's um, definition as well. And so I would sort of refer people back to that and his um, approach as a way of understanding that um, again, you know, universal empowerment where you're also keeping everybody free from domination by one another is about a cluster of mechanisms working together um, to balance power within a population, basically. So just one more question for me and then we'll um, uh, uh, turn toward our audience Q&A. But your work, uh, the, the book that you published about your cousin Michael called Cuz, yes. Yes. Um, and, it's, and it's such a, um, a, a compelling and um, heartfelt uh, a statement about about a phenomenon around uh, mass incarceration and 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 how it is crippling communities across our country, and my question then goes back to these founding documents: is the solution to um, really pressing challenges like mass incarceration, concerns about policing and over-policing in communities of color, uh, concerns about the impact, the disproportionate impact of the drug war on communities of color and, and other social justice concerns. Is liberalism in the manner, in, in the spirit in which we've been describing it here, is the liberal project up to the task of addressing social justice concerns like these? I think as an analytical matter, the answer is yes. Um, but I think there's a different question with regards to sort of the practical matter of the present, you know, and sort of how our institutions are functioning and the like. Um, so basically, I think, you know, sort of what the liberal project requires is a real assessment of where laws are supporting safety and well being and where they're undermining them. And we tend to neglect that second kind of analysis. Um, you know, our policymaking landscape is sort of tends to be more focused on. At producing ever more laws to deliver safety and happiness, where as opposed to like figuring out the laws that are actually undermining safety and happiness and like, getting rid of them, taking some of them away. So I do think we have to make space intellectually for that second project um, in our policymaking landscape. Um, and in a related fashion, I think that you know, this comes back to the sort of Eleanor Ostrom material that we were talking about. Um, we really need more clarity about the kinds of work that need to be done at the level of the community, at the level of the state, 
set at the level of the federal government in order to support uh, the development of health and well-being for communities to sort of reduce um, the need for penal systems, sanctioning systems, and the like. Um, but I think actually succeeding on that front requires projects of self-governance um, at all those levels. And I think that is a place where we also need considerable rebuilding. Um, and this is not sort of a point about whether people are or are not, you know, equipped to do self-governance. I think actually by and large people are equipped to do self-governance. I think we have removed opportunities for people to govern uh, and participate in self-governance. And I think we have to rebuild those opportunities. That's really helpful. And what a great note to turn toward our audience. So I'm going to invite Brad Jackson back, uh, who's going to moderate the queue and, and help us with the remainder of our conversation. Thank you very much. And thank you both for that uh, wonderful and very interesting uh, conversation. We have a, a number of questions in the queue, but if uh, folks have questions, I definitely encourage you to add them to the queue as we can still be looking at those uh, during this time. Uh, we'll start with a question uh, that has to do with some kind of recent events and how to place those events within the context of American history and some of our thoughts about liberalism broadly. Uh, so the questioner in particular was asking about uh, what Tocqueville might say about the connection between the post-Civil War era and the post-January 6th era, kind of drawing a uh, connection between those events. And I, I would add beyond like, what might Tocqueville say about it? What would you say about it? And, 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 and how might it, uh, how <laughs> might it differ? Can I just answer for Tocqueville? Tocqueville? That'd be so much easier. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, so it's a great question. Um, it, let me just, I mean, the question, in some sense, the question is, are we in another era of reconstruction? And if so, uh, what does that require of us? And can we do better than last time round? Um, I think that we're not actually quite yet to the point of being in the era of reconstruction, because I think the fight is still underway, to tell you the truth. Um, and so I think we're all struggling to understand exactly what the nature of the fight is that's underway in our country right now. I think we don't actually have clarity yet about precisely what's going on for us as a society. Um, so I think if the question is less, is, it, is the era of reconstruction here and what do we do? Um, and more a question of, okay, we can see the degree of conflict. How do we respond to that? Then I do think Tocqueville does have useful answers. I do think that a lot of the work has to be about rebuilding at a very, very local level with the people in communities who have the greatest capacity for bridge building, uh, stepping up and taking leadership roles, finding ways in the context of literally municipal government and local activities um, to bring people up together across lines of division for some project of common action and to take the opportunities of such work to do intentional work on relationship building, seeking mutual understanding and the like. Um, so it's, I, don't, I don't think that there's a kind of top down solution. Um, I do think it is about rebuilding trust, trustworthiness um, at a very, very local level. And Brad, can I jump in on and ask another question that's related to that? What what does the average citizen do? What, what kind of thing, when we're talking about leadership, local leadership, uh, people have different understandings of what that means. You know, they assume if they haven't been elected to, to some office that that's not them. But I hear something different. I hear, I hear you calling upon citizens for something from them as well, that, that the demands of, of, of governing together means that, that we've got to uh, govern together and that, that we have to do that in the context of our ordinary lives. Or do you have an example of the kind of thing that we can do as ordinary citizens that makes a difference that doesn't require sort of elected office? Well, I'm sure you've heard of an organization called Braver Angels, um, which has been building out around the country um, and it, working in a kind of way such as I described, where in communities that are riven by strife, they find leaders on opposite sides of those lines of division and put them through a pretty kind of long-term process of getting to know each other, trying to start, of, start to redefine what the issues are that are the sources of strife, and then moving forward to act. So the, I first encountered them when they were doing work in Minneapolis. This was you know, before, well before the Floyd events, um, trying to bring together uh, police and um, the black community in Minneapolis. Um, and 
So the point is not that it always has to be specifically that you're trying to build a context where people are taking on the intentional work of building bridges. Um, it can also be just that there is work that has to be done in a community. And for example, you know, making a decision about whether or not to build a new library. This is, a, this is an example coming out of some things I've encountered in Massachusetts recently. And you know, then the, the work on that project starts to devolve into a very local misinformation campaign or disinformation campaign and get sucked into the same kind of polarized divisions that we see for federal poli politics. You wouldn't think you know, building a library would trigger that sort of thing. Um, so then the question is like in moments like that, um, who can within the community sort of step forward and start building um, the kind of networks of connection that can start to bring people back together and you know, put whatever the burning issue is or to the side for a moment while some work is done to try to achieve enough mutual understanding to move forward again. So that's very, very granular, but I do actually think that sort of where we see conflicts emerging in our local communities, um, those are opportunities for leadership. And the question is, you know, who are the bridge builders you know, on either side of a conflict who are willing to say, the sort of stake in the ground and say, like, no, like community is actually more important and we're just gonna have to like do the work of trying to figure out how to build a context for talking again. Uh, and, the next you know, maybe that's completely pie in the sky, but. Uh, the, uh, the, the next question, I uh, had a couple questions about this, has to do with how we think about the people within the context of a democracy. Uh, and I'm going to phrase this question in kind of a Rousseauan terms, where it seems like you're distinguishing between the will of all on the one hand and the general will on the other hand where ultimately democracy should be aiming not just at the majoritarian opinion, uh, but rather at some kind of thickly or less thickly constituted notion of some kind of common good of the people, or, or maybe, maybe that's not, not the quite right way, way to put it, but in any sense, something that's distinct from merely uh, the uh, majority will. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we constitute that notion of the people and how it is that we go about distinguishing between majority opinion and something like the common good or uh, whatever phrase you might stick into that place. Right. So I'm willing to accept the public good. I'm just not willing to describe that as Rousseauian general will. Okay. <laughs> so, so let me try to um, let me try to answer that. Thanks. It's a good question. Um, so basically, as I see it, I mean, this is the work of democratic process and democratic institutions. And what democratic process and institutions should deliver is solutions that actually ultimately align perfectly with nobody's point of view, okay? Precisely because what the process and institutions are doing is discovering solution pathways that were not visible from the specific perspective of any given individual. Um, and the point is that those solution pathways should deliver something that secures the sort of broad collective happiness and safety in the language of the Declaration of Independence, which can be broadly endorsed as doing that. Never will any decision be endorsed by everybody. So hence, it's not the Rousseauian general will. You're never going to get unanimity. Um, but what you do want to be getting is very, you know, as, as often as possible, um, decisions that really do win supermajority support from the general public. And we, we actually can do this, and we know we can, because if you analyze who we are as a people, not by looking at our federal electoral results, but by looking at the results of ballot propositions, ballot measures, we very often have supermajority votes on ballot measures, okay? Um, so we are actually capable, so examples would be, uh, so of drug legalization, 15 states by now have legalized marijuana. A number of those votes have been supermajority votes. The felon reenfranchisement vote in Florida was a supermajority vote. Uh, Massachusetts campaign finance uh, ballot proposition is a supermajority vote. You can go sort of through the mix. The flag in Missouri, I think it was this past go around, or Mississippi, can't remember, getting rid of the Confederate emblems, replacing them with new ones, supermajority vote. Right. So we're actually capable of using our processes and institutions to find solution pathways that can secure uh, supermajority support. That for me kind of captures what the goal is here, is kind of conversion of a problem that's recognized as a problem into a solution pathway that does deliver a collective kind of conception of the good that wins legitimacy as supermajority. 
level. Now, you're not going to have every decision winning supermajority support. Sometimes you do just need, you know, that 50 plus one decision because you got to like break through an impasse. You got to make a decision. But we also have to recognize that those moments, those aren't stable. And the whole thing's just going to kind of keep, you know, equilibrating and vacillating until you hit the solution that actually does secure supermajority support over time. So that is, it's a dynamic system. That's the sort of important thing to recognize. We've also had a question about the relative balance between state, local, and federal power. And uh, the questioner is wondering whether there is any opportunity in our current politics to do a rebalancing toward the states as laboratories of democracy, or is it the case in your view that the federal government simply must do so much that such a rebalancing would be uh, impossible. Uh, and the questioner in particular is interested in the relative tax rates, uh, pointing out that we pay a greater proportion of our income in federal rather than in state taxes, uh, and wonders if we flip that uh, balance and gave the states more resources to work with, uh, would we be on our way to having a better sense of community uh, with, within the local levels that we're living within? So could you say a few words about those sort of questions? That's a great question. That's a great, great question. So I don't think that we need to think that the current um, balance and structure are the end of the road in terms of what's possible. I do think that this is a moment that calls for creativity in this regard. Um, and I do think that um, seeing more of what states can do um, and rethinking how the federal government supports states um, in hitting standards that meet the equal protection of the laws requirement um, I think there's a pathway there. And I think that is uh, something that we should be working on. The question about taxes is super interesting. I haven't thought about it precisely that way before, um, but I do think there's a conversation to be had there. So, um, so thank you for putting that question on the table. If I could jump in too, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on the conservative critique of the administrative state in this regard, because there's there it seems to me like this could be a common ground kind of conversation if we framed it the right way. Um, so you know, in in uh, the the brief version of it is that that um, unelected, un, you know, potentially unaccountable, sort of faceless um, agencies at the federal level have have replaced. Um, or have stepped in to solve problems that in a prior era might have been solved at a much more local level, still perhaps collectively, but at a much more local level, and that it has left people feeling disempowered. And it's one of the things that struck me when I was um, reading uh, through uh, the common purpose work is, is that it seems like there's, uh, your work is, is pointing to a real hunger for re-engagement at the local level, um, a disengagement um, at the federal level. I, and, and perhaps there's something to that, that, that perhaps there's a, a thread here with the conservative case um, against the administrative state that um, our problem solving entities have become so big and removed from us that it's taken out the relational component. And so, um, and my, I could imagine us getting into the room, um, left of center liberals and, uh, and, and conservatives. And, and if we started out, is the state too big? You know, we'd get a clash, right? R right out of the gate. But, but if we ask the question, how can we re, how can we re-spark and reignite an engagement, civic engagement, and um, start there that with a common problem. Um, and, and some people would be entering the room with the the critique of the administrative state in their head and others would be would be saying, no, we wanna activate the, the um, uh, citizenship in a sense of solidarity more. Um, so they would be coming at the problem from different perspectives, but perhaps if we framed it as a common ground challenge uh, there, that there'd be some fruit there. So I think there is a common ground space. I would actually probably suggest a different way of getting people to the table. Um, and I don't know if this way would work for folks on the conservative side, but I think there's a question about um, how can we achieve effective governance um, that would bring people from the left of center side to the table where the question of effective governance, for me, the answer to that question is through what I call harmonized federalism, which is what I was trying to describe before, where you do the work of figuring out the jurisdictional level at which different functions should be um, carried out and then um, work to sort of harmonize the relationship to those 
things that in that kind of picture, the federal government is often in a supportive role, supportive of the work that states and municipals are doing, as opposed to in a mandating role. Um, so it's a sort of like flip of the switch in that regard. But so the difference, so the, the important thing, I guess, I mean, sort of, you know, so yes, um, I do think, I mean, I, as just speaking for myself, I do share a critique of the administrative state. And I think that you will find, you know, some chunk of left of center folks where that's true, not everybody by any stretch of the imagination, but some chunk. But then on the other side, I think there's the um, problem of a sort of starting point where there's sort of like presumed that the best answer to the question of what the role for the federal government should be is no role, okay? And that's a sort of non-starter on the other side for, I think, very good reasons. I think it's, you know, it's to miss exactly the same point I was making in the Federalist Papers before about they ask the questions like, well, what are the functions that should be carried out at a national level? There are some functions that should be carried out at that level. And so I do think, you know, if we can get folks from the right of the center to the table and there's openness to the question of, okay, well, let's acknowledge that there is a role for the federal government and let's figure out what the right version of that is. And then that's where I would get to the sort of fit, switching the, uh, flipping the switch from the mandate picture of the federal government to the supportive of the functionality of the other jurisdictional levels picture for the federal government. Thank you. Uh, the next question that I would like us to turn to is a question regarding the role of the academy and specifically of academics in uh, pursuing a better form of liberalism or pursuing the sort of social change that we've been talking about today. What, what role do you think that you know, faculty members who make up the majority of uh, IHS's uh, audience, uh, what role would uh, faculty members play in, in your point of view? That's a super interesting question. Um, well, you know, uh, that's a, that's a, <laughs> feels like a very, very big question. Um, I mean, I think there are lots of elements that are needed. I do think that we need to rebuild um, the parts of our education for undergraduates that are about understanding constitutionalism, understanding governance, understanding the relationship between civic engagement, citizen engagement, and um, effective governance. Um, all these themes that we've been talking about, they have less space in the curriculum um, than they should have. So in other words, if you take the conversation we've had over this hour, as you know, marking out the terrain of curriculum, there should be more room for this kind of conversation in curricula in higher ed than there is. That would be point one. Point two would be another thing that you're doing with this program, which is that you are seeking people from different parts of the ideological spectrum and bringing them in or bringing us into conversation with one another. We need more of that and intentionality around doing that. Um, my center runs something called the Intercollegiate Civil Disagreement um, Project, which is um, multiple campuses around the country where students are working together to learn actually skills of mediation um, and negotiation. And then they pick hot button topics to invite speakers who are different sides of the balance on. And then in addition to that event, which we try to structure to make productive, we also have smaller group discussions afterwards where we're trying to bring together students whose starting points and perspectives are on different ends of the spectrum. So I think that we just generally all need more work of that kind. So I guess I would focus on those two things for starters. So uh, the next question is, is my own, and, and this comes out of the fact that I'm also a, a political theorist, and so I simply can't re resist asking. Uh, could you comment a bit on some of the other 20th century thinkers who have worked on the Declaration of Independence and your relationship to their points of view? And folks I have in mind in particular would be you know, Carl Becker, uh, Harry Jaffa, Pauline Mayer, right? So there've been a lot of different ways of looking at this, uh, at, at this document and what it means. Uh, and I think that many of these points of view have good points and bad points within themselves. And I, I just wonder if you could comment on some of the previous work that's been done and how you look at it. Right, okay. Well, let me go backwards in time. So let me start with Pauline. And so Pauline, of course, um, wrote a beautiful book about the many other kinds of declarations that were written before this declaration. And the structure of the argument is basically that, as you know, Jefferson himself said, yeah, I just was recording this, the spirit of the times. I wasn't really innovating or doing anything new. And I mean, I think she's right to have sketched out a whole world of conversation. People were thinking about the same problems. They were really chewing on them, wrestling with them. 
But at the same time, I do think it's also the case that the Declaration of Independence itself achieves some conceptual breakthroughs, as I described. So it's not just a record of the spirit of the times. Though, honestly, I don't credit Jefferson with the breakthroughs. I think that it was John Adams who achieved those breakthroughs. And I could go through how I documented that, but that's another that's a conversation for another day. Um, but so, so that would be a difference from Pauline. Um, and, um, and then to um, Harry Jaffa, um, so obviously, you know, he made a powerful case for the way in which Lincoln um, recognized the content of the Declaration and kind of regrounded formally the country sort of on its basis. And I think that's, you know, I largely agree with that. In fact, the place where I probably part ways some with Harry Jaffa, it would be the points I was making about philosophical errors in the founding. So I do think that, you know, P Professor Jaffa was more it was more sort of an, a, a picture of the answers were all there in the beginning and we just needed to let the answers unfold. I think some of the answers were there in the beginning, but I think there were also mistakes in the beginning and we had to correct the mistakes in order actually to achieve the unfolding of the, um, of the answers. And then Carl Becker, honestly, I've always, I've turned to him just as a kind of useful resource because uh, he did such an amazing job of assembling, you know, sort of basic facts and sort of picture of the period and have not given as much thought to some of the substance of his arguments. I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to let that one go. I apologize, Brad. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Uh, the uh, next question that uh, we, we have, which I think is a, a very interesting one, it points us back to this distinction that you were making earlier between patriotism and solidarity and asks if you would just dive a little bit more deeply into that and talk about ways in which you think that we can a bridge that divide you uh, had your kind of phrase that you had used earlier that kind of re replaces it or tries to bring it together. And I wonder if you could uh, kind of break that phrase down a little bit and just talk about the work you think it's doing. Sure. I can offer one piece of good news, which is that the one phrase that did seem viable on both sides was love of country. So that was something. So that's something to sort of start working with. And so um, I have sort of begun a bit of an experiment of asking people from a variety of different backgrounds and contexts to just tell me their story of their love of country. Because actually, as best as I can tell, just huge numbers of people have such a story. The stories are very different. And it's entirely possible for people to have stories of love of country that are also compatible with stories of real anger at country or criticism of country. These things can live together, just as they do in our families. You know, we can all love family members that we are just desperately angry at at the same time. So that's a piece of it. And I think actually just asking people to articulate um, you know, what it is they do love about the place that they call home um, at the same time that we're also articulating our criticisms and our challenges to our country is a valuable exercise. In terms of unpacking that mouthful phrase, you know, sort of share a mutual, restoring a sense of mutual commitment to one another and shared commitment to our constitutional democracy. There's a way in which that goes back to the declaration, right? That is, um, that emancipation is actually not a project you can do in a solitary fashion. It is partly about private autonomy, but it is also about public autonomy, about making some decisions together and recognizing that there are some things that are public goods and some things that we can only do together. And to build and sustain the capacity to do that work together, we do need a sense of mutual commitment to one another, that we're in something together, we have a shared fate. And so then the question is, okay, how do you connect that individual emancipation to the stuff that we do need to share? Um, well, that is through that constitutional democracy. So that's why we need a shared commitment to constitutional democracy, because it's the thing that makes it possible for us, us to have like a tolerable uh, mutual commitment to one another where having that commitment to each other is not in itself, you know, oppressive, basically. So, you know, you got to have that constitutional democracy piece in there in order to make realizable, you know, a kind of mutual commitment to one another in all of our diversity and heterogeneity. Thank you. I think this will probably be our, our last question, and it has to do with uh, the way in which today on the left and the right, it seems as though we have a lot of trouble talking across ideological barriers. And, and, and the questioner compares these to almost Cunian paradigms, where it's as though you know, like uh, someone who you know, believes strictly in Newtonian physics just can't have a conversation with someone who's doing quantum physics uh, in some way. But the, the terms are completely different. The kind of vision of reality is different. And the questioner wonders, 
one, whether that's uh, an accurate way to, to think about the way in which these ideological bubbles are sort of forming, uh, misinformation bubbles on either side, we might say, uh, and how we can start to break some of that, uh, those barriers down. I know you mentioned braver angels earlier, but are, are, are there other conversational tactics that folks can maybe use in their own lives or that uh, perhaps think academics can use in analyzing the world to help break down some of these ideological barriers that have been rising? So this is a question I'm really stuck on actually. And it's a question that's more about politics than about ideas. So our politics operates in such a way that people benefit from throwing caricatures at one another. And that's what we're trapped in, right? So right now, lots of people hate the caricature white supremacy, okay? Totally get that. On the other side, lots of people hate the character socialist. <laughs> hate it just as much, right? So, you know, the label socialist is thrown around where it does not apply. Now, some people have embraced the label. So that's an interesting change in the dynamic. But, you know, it was thrown around lots in politics in places that it did not apply. The label white supremacy is thrown around lots in politics in places where it does not apply. And so then somehow, like, real conversation ceases to be possible. That's, that's the thing I'm stuck on. And I know that you know, well-meaning people are really easily able to sit down and like talk through those labels and get to a place where they can actually have productive conversations. But there are others in our political world who actually just don't really care, I don't think, about actually having well-meaning, good faith conversations. And for them, the caricatures are very powerful and useful. And I can't really honestly figure out how to turn off the value of those caricatures to those folks who are only interested in instrumental political power. And I think unless we can figure that out, we're kind of stuck. Can I jump on, on that thread, uh, Brad, that I that in this is in the spirit of a yes and kind of, yes, the, the destructive uh, power of caricature is, is something we need to overcome. I heard the question a little differently, which is you've got mm -hmm. these, you know, two two different ways of seeing the world. They look at the same evidence and they draw very, very different conclusions. And, and I think I'm thinking in, in particular in uh, the scholarly discourse around, around um, some of these topics that we've been discussing um, where that applies. And to me, this also goes to the point about why intellectual diversity is so important. So much of the conversation around a campus speech and, and um, uh, diversity of thought on campus has, uh, I think, inappropriately been couched as a kind of equal time kind of argument, you know, equal time for the conservatives kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and I think that totally misses the point, right? It, it, it's, we need intellectual diversity because it, it challenges us to step outside of our own framework of thought so that we interrogate why we have, we are capable of interrogating why we have the assumptions that we have. How is it that I know the stuff that I know? And I, and I, don't know the stuff that I don't know. How is that? Well, what's my framework of thought? Well, it, it might require another framework of thought for me to kind of dwell in for a while to really challenge, uh, to really to see it. Um, I used to teach comparative economic systems and, and though I'm very much a free market kind of gal, right? I would teach Marxism as if, it, if I were a Marxist because it was so powerful in helping people to unmoor from their presumptions and their assumptions that were uninterrogated. And so it was a very powerful teaching tool for me to dwell in the, in the world of Marxism as if I really, really believed it because I think even those who walked away feeling sure that that market society was was the right way to go now understood why Marx was so influential across the the 20th century right it really shaped the 20th century mm -hmm. and you didn't see that unless you were exposed in a very deep and thoughtful way to that other point of view so perhaps uh, comment on on that and close us out sure no, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that um, intellectual excellence, you know, requires um, freedom of expression. These things are mutually reinforcing and we definitely need, um, you know, exposure to viewpoints very different from our own um, to test our own, to understand where they come from, to also understand why other people um, ultimately judge differently about what the right answer is. And so I guess, I think what I was um, maybe responding to in the question is, um, 
I, in my own life experience, maybe this is, well, it's obviously limited, but it's, and partial, um, I do get the chance to sit down with people from different ideological points of view and wrestle with evidence. And I don't really have the experience of looking at the same facts and coming to completely different conclusions. Um, I have the experience instead of looking at the same facts and then clarifying what are the choice points where I'm choosing this principle, you're choosing that principle, or I'm choosing this prioritization, you're choosing that prioritization. And those are places where we have to make judgment calls. And so then you can bring those judgment calls to the surface, explain why you're making your judgment call. And yes, you've come out to a different place, but not because you've seen a different thing, but because you've made a different judgment and you can explain those different judgments to one another. And that I don't have any problem doing. It's a kind of common experience in my life. Um, and so that's what I was sort of making the point about the kind of caricature labels is that I don't, I, I think that's totally within our capacity to have conversations of that kind, but we don't have space for it at all um, because we have this shadow boxing with caricatures that has become our norm. And I love that. And it's, it's a great way for us to end the conversation because it goes full circle back to the importance of human agency, that not only do we have the, the raw material to set our course for the future, but also we can take responsibility for what we know and, and what we assume and, and the conclusions right. that we draw. And that that's an, that's an essential and important part of, of being a citizen with agency and efficacy. So yep. thank you for closing us out on this point. Thank you, Danielle, for, for being with us this afternoon. And um, thank you for all the great work that you're doing and all the great teaching that you continue to do. My pleasure. Thank you for a great conversation. I truly enjoyed it. So thanks for making the space for it.